Okay, so let's open our Bible to Second Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, we'll read from verses 1 to 10. You can follow in your Bible. Second Corinthians chapter 12 from verse 1 to 10. I will see the screen and I will read. It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knows. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth. How that he was caught up into the paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such an one will I glory yet of myself, I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me about that which seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Almighty God, thank and praise you for your faithfulness. Lord, we've been very thankful since we have started Second Corinthians. Uh, every Tuesday you are speaking with us and uh, more deeper things you are showing us. And really we want to thank you for giving the Holy Spirit so that we may be able to dig on the Word of God and find out a deeper meaning. So we thank you for the life of Paul. He teaches us so many things. And we saw how much he suffered, Lord. So today's portion, Lord, anoint me afresh through Holy Spirit. Put the words within my heart, Lord, within my mind, uh, with the, my tongue, Lord, I may be a spokesperson for you, Lord. And thy word may glorify you and edify every one of us, Lord. Your word is very precious, Lord. And the topic which we are on right now, on the grace, uh, which will never end. And we'll learn more and more of your grace, even in the ages to come. So, so how much less we know about grace, Lord. But you have put a burden in my heart to know more of the grace, whatever we know. So anoint me afresh once again. Let me hide behind the cross. Let you be lifted up, Lord. Speak with us. We can say like Samuel, speak, Lord, Master, for thy servant here, Lord. Give us that circumcised ears and heart to receive thy word. Bless thy word in the precious and most worthy name of Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So as we have been um, meditating on chapter 12 of 2 Corinthians, and uh, Lord has put in my heart, because this is a very important word in the Bible, uh, grace. And last time, uh, bef before I go to the PowerPoint, last time we saw a key definition of grace, and that is grace is the power and desire to, the will, to do the will of God in our life. Grace is the power and desire to do the will of God in our life. That's the grace. And now, as I said, grace is a very important word in the Bible. And when we think of grace, another word should come exactly opposite of grace, and that is sin. Remember, because 
you know, uh, when we look at the Old Testament, I was just thinking of all this thing. When we look at the Old Testament, uh, we say, well, that it is all about the law. If anybody you ask uh, any believer, he says, oh, now I'm in the grace period or I'm in the New Testament. No, I'm not in the law. So we divide the Old Testament and New Testament by these two words. We are not in the law, but we are in grace period. So this has been division and we are in the grace period, no doubt about it, you know. But when we look at the Old Testament, uh, uh, is there, was there grace not at all in the Old Testament? Oh, yes, very true. In the Old Testament, we were not, they were not without grace. You know, if, if you see the first mention of grace, uh, you can go in your Bible or you can project it till I go on the uh, PowerPoint, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. Genesis 6 and verse 8. Okay, I'll read from here. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Noah found grace. See, that's the first word, first mention of grace in the uh, eyes of the Lord uh, towards those who were living during the time of uh, Noah and only Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. Now, did it end there? No. Grace continues uh, throughout the whole Testament, but was practically, you know, practically first, though the word grace is not mentioned, but it was practically seen in Adam and Eve because when Adam and Eve sinned by being disobedient to the word of God, what did God do? He took a lamb, he shed the blood, and he took a skin of the uh, animal and he covered them. So grace was seen in the very first act in the Bible, but the word is not mentioned. Remember the blood was shed and they were covered. And we are also covered by the grace of Lord Jesus Christ. And we see that there was grace during that time. So Adam and Eve sinned. Now, when I was thinking on it, you know, I was thinking, where did the sin come? You know, Lord had told the day you will eat this fruit, you will die. Why? Because sin entered into the human race. It was permeated into the, but we don't know exactly the origin of sin. We may say, yes, Satan became proud and uh, sin entered in heaven, but how do we know that there was no sin at all? So we exactly, we don't know the origin of sin. And uh, we know according to Hebrews 9.22 and according, and according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of the blood, there is no remission. So the blood was shed and the sin was covered and the grace was seen over there. Now, just think of it, you know. I was just thinking a lot of things I was thinking on this. Just think of the power of sin. Now, Satan knew, I believe, the power of that sin. That sin is tremendous, which we cannot, we can personify Sin. Sin is tremendous. And I believe Satan knew about this sin that if it permeates in the human race, it is going to destroy everything. So sin is so powerful that it permeated and Satan knew that. And he made Adam and Eve to sin. And, uh, and uh, the sin entered into the human race, into this world. And then we see that uh, when the Lord created heaven and the earth in Genesis 1 and so many things he created by the word, why not by the word he could destroy sin? Why? I was thinking on it. You know, he redeemed Israel from Egypt by so many miracles. What about sin? Why was it not irradi irradiated? You know, it totally removed. But he could have said, go away, sin, no more sin. Again, say, uh, uh, go, Adam, and live like the way I wanted you to live. No, the sin entered the human race. And, and we read in Romans that sin came to us because of Adam. So sin is so powerful, so powerful, 
when I was thinking only, just think of it. We are born again, washed by the blood of Lord Jesus Christ. But out of all who are sitting in this Zoom in all around the world believers, tell me one person who doesn't sin even after being born again. Can you see the power of that sin? And the more I'm thinking on this sin, it's like it's beyond, it's beyond more power than Satan also, I believe. Such sin, such great sin. And when we see that, uh, when we see that uh, Lord, uh, as he uh, gave the sacrifice and the blood was shed, so even though our sins have been forgiven, we continue to sin, right? And what I want to say is that Lord, in order to deal with the sin, he, couldn't, he did not say a word because it was so powerful that he himself, as a triune God, he became man to come down on this earth and die for that sin, S-I-N. So powerful it was that God had to come down to live like a man and become man like us and die for our sins. So it was tremendous power. And even that power is still there because we still sin. What is this sin? It's beyond man's understanding. But one thing we want to thank the Lord. If you go to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, if you can project on the screen, I have it here, but if you can project, it would be good. Now, there are three things which has been mentioned over here. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves. That is true, right? That we should not trust in ourselves. That is true. But we should trust in God. Why? Because he raised the dead. Then what did he do? Who delivered us from so great a death because of sin, death came. And thus deliver, and we trust in, and we trust that he will yet deliver. Mark that word delivered. There are in verse 10, there are three times the word deliver has been mentioned. Who delivered us, us who delivered past tense. So when we were born again, we were delivered from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin was death, but the Lord Jesus Christ took our penalty. Remember the sin is so powerful. Jesus, Lord Jesus, the second person of the triune word came on this earth to become man and he died for that sin. So penalty, he has delivered from the penalty of sin from so great death because of sin and death delivered, that is present. So he's delivered in present from the power of sin through the Holy Spirit. No more penalty of sin for us, but the sin is still there and is still delivering us by the power of the Holy Spirit. But the time will come and the last delivery says, whom we trust that he will yet deliver us, yet future. And that will be in, there will be, there will be no, uh, there will be no presence of sins. He has delivered, first delivered is past present from the penalty of sin. Second deliver is the present, is delivering us from the power of sin. And third, he will still deliver, that is from the presence of sin. So I believe when we will be with him in heaven, there will be no sin. So sin, it started in heaven, but we don't know where it started. And that's why the sin is tremendous. And I hate that sin because we all, by thoughts, words, and deeds, we sin. And I always say, Lord, why? This is tremendous. Sin is not going away. But I thank that you have delivered me from the penalty of sin. Now, through the power of your Holy Spirit, from the power of sin, you are taking care of me. And then in the time to come, full presence of sin will not be there. Oh, what a wonderful time that would be when there will be no sin. So just think about sin. And God needed grace. Sin, law, grace. Three words. Very, very powerful. So we are in the grace period. Now that's why New Testament is full of grace. John chapter 1 and verse 16. You can put it on the screen. That's As we read John, we always enjoy. And of his fullness, we have received. Or we all have received what? Grace for grace, not only grace for grace, grace for grace, grace for grace. So grace affects every area of our Christian life. And without it, we would be men most miserable. Just remove grace. 
and we will be most miserable. We would not spiritually survive without the grace of God. Now, grace of God is essential and adequate for every area of our life, from the salvation to service, from surviving, suffering, to being saintly. The very much important what, what I want to bring, you know, many times why I'm putting more emphasis this time on the grace. Maybe I'll need one or two more sessions on this because many times we think grace is just born again. Penalty of sin, we won't be there. Power of, power of sin will not be there because Holy Spirit will help us to guard it. And later on, there will be no presence of sin. So grace will look as regarding the sin and the death is concerned. But we forget that grace is needed in every, every moment, every second of our life. We need that. Just think of it as you get up in the morning and the Lord says, no more oxygen in the air. What happens? Everybody will die. So what is that oxygen given for? It's a grace. So we need grace not only for our salvation. Yes, that is important. But grace we need for every, every need of ours. So grace is a dynamic force. Totally, totally transforming believer's life. Now, when we see it, it starts at the salvation, right? See Acts chapter 15 and verse 11. I will give a few verses only, not more, because it will take a long time. Acts 15, 11. But we believe that through the grace of Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. So we believe we will be saved. So the so salvation, beginning of the salvation is by grace. And then it continues grace. Through sanctification, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But we grow in grace, see? So when we grow in grace, we are sanctified day by day by day. And not only we grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever and ever. So we grow, continually grow through sanctification by grace. And Ultimately, there will be glorification for us. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 7. Ephesians 2 and verse 7. That in the ages to come. See, I will go to, the, to that later on also. In the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So that is the glorification. When we are glorified, the Lord is going to show us the exceeding riches of his grace in the ages to come. So when we go to Ephesians uh, chapter 1, and uh, from verses 4 onwards, we see few things over there. I don't want you to put it on the screen. First, we see the riches of his grace, which is talks about what is the riches of his grace. First of all, in uh, from verses Ephesians 1, from verse 4 to 6, we see the Father's grace. This is the riches of his grace, okay? We see the Father's grace. That is blessings planned in eternity past. You see, if you read those verses, it says, in eternity the Lord had decided us. That was his grace. So it is the Father's favor. He has chosen us. He has predestined us. And that was his grace. So that's Father's favor. Then we see... From verse 6 to 12, we see the son's sacrifice, the blessing procured and possessed in the present. So Lord Jesus Christ came and died for us. So Father already had a favor uh, for us. He chosen us, it predestined us, but the Lord came and he died for us. And the Holy Spirit also works because the Holy Spirit seals us. Verse 13 and 14 of Ephesians 1. He blessings of grace will be consummated and it is guaranteed in eternity and future. So from we see the Father's grace in eternity past from these verses, Father's grace in eternity past, the Son's grace in this history, and the Spirit's grace that is bringing forth our future glory. All the three persons of the triune God, grace works. Past, present, future. 
Father has chosen us. Lord died for us. And the Holy Spirit keeps us by His grace. What a wonderful God we have. Now, one more important thing which I want to bring before you. Mark this very much important. Grace you will not find in any religion. And this is what I wrote down. Grace sets Christian Christ, uh, grace sets the Christian faith apart from all other religion. God is gracious, benevolent, kind, and in contrast to gods of false religion, if you co compare contrast with the gods of false religion who are best indifferent and need constant to be appeased, that means somebody has to please them. Then only that God will give some kind of favor. See, the difference between our, our Lord, grace all the time. You don't have to please him or do anything. And we were without, we were sinners. As uh, Romans 5, 6, 8, and 10, read it. Without, when we were without strength, when we were sinners, and we were still enemies. That's the grace of God. But in the other religion, you will not see grace. What a great God we have. And we thank the Lord for this grace. In Ephesians 2 and verse 4, 5 and 6 and verse 7. If you can put it together, maybe we can, I'll just read it from it. Ephesians 2. Can you put it together, 4 to 7 on the screen? All right. But God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, he has quickened us together with Christ. And then see, by grace, he are saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And Mark verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us, to Christ Jesus. Just keep that screen on. Now, grace of God does not end with this age. Grace of God does not end with this age. When I was looking at what does it mean by present age? The present age means it's known in the Bible as this age. This time, the present age, this world, it covers the period from creation to the second coming of Lord Jesus Christ. Right? That is, this is age. This is this age. And verse says, in the ages to come, that is future. In the ages to come, which is future. What is that ages to come? Known in the Bible as the century to come, the age to come, it starts from the second coming of Christ and it lasts for eternity. That is the ages to come the riches of his grace. Just think about it. It's not talking about his love. It's not talking about anything, but grace will continue and he will teach us ages to come. What we know about grace? Nothing. So, and in Ephesians 2 and verse 8, let me go to the power. Give me uh, to share, please. Okay, we saw last time the key definition, and let me go to the next. Now, as I saw, grace is the dynamic force totally transforming the believer's life. And as I reminded you, it begins at salvation and continuing through sanctification, which we read that, to glorification. So from beginning, it we are sanctified day by day till we glorify in Ephesians 6, 1, Ephesians 1, 4 to 14, we see the riches of his grace. Uh, we see the Father's fa favor, that is the blessing planned in eternity past. If you read this verse, it will show us predestined. And the Son sacrificed the blessing procured and possessed in the present, that is present. And the Holy Spirit saved, that is glory, guaranteed in eternity future, verse 13 to 14. 
And then, as I said, if you saw uh, the father's grace in eternity past, son's grace in the history, and the spirit grace bringing forth our future. But I just wanted to bring, because we only think why we need grace is only for salvation. Because, yes, we need that. See, if you see to Ephesians 2, eight for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. So grace is needed for sin. Many times we believe this is what we need just for, for being saved. But I just took out, these are just very few, okay? I could not go into any more detail. Just see where how much grace is needed and where it is needed. I'm not going to read all these verses. I just put it on the screen in case if you want to go back again and go to the YouTube, you can copy it <clears throat> or you can take a screen, screenshot. Grace is, can justify us. If you see in Romans 3 and 24, uh, I won't read it, but grace justifies. So we need to be justified. We need grace. Psalm 84 and 11, as I said, psalmist knew what grace was. Grace can give what all good things. If you want good things, what do you need? Grace. Not only for salvation. You need grace, grace to have all good things. Then we need grace. So it imparts great blessings. Acts 4.33. Yes. Grace can overcome sin. You see, right now we live, but sin is still there. But grace through Holy Spirit will help us to overcome sin. Even though our sins have been forgiven. And as I said, that power of sin is it's not leaving us. Not leaving us. So powerful but we can overcome by God's grace. Fifthly, grace can help in the time of need. Hebrews 4, 16. What is the time of need? Your time of need may be different. My time of need may be different. The time of need for all the saints in the Old Testament was different. In the New Testament was different. So your, when you need in the time of need, this is the only one we'll have. See, grace is not only for saving. Grace can bring hope. You are without hope. Ask God. That's why I said every day as I get up, I pray, Lord, give me your extra, extra grace from the moment I, I'm, I, I, I got up in the morning till I go to sleep. And even at night, before I pray, Lord, your grace be with you. If it is your will, give me good sleep and wake me in the morning. So grace we need. Grace can change our life. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Grace can give boldness. If you want boldness to, to give the word of God, you need boldness for Lord Jesus Christ. It, you need grace. You need grace for endurance. Yes, many things we have to go through. It's very difficult. But how are we going to endure grace? 11. Sorry, I did put this. It should be 10 onward. But grace can give us seasoning to speech. If you go to Rome, Colossians 4 and say, grace, we need to speak. How many times we speak wrong things? But we can say, Lord, give me grace that when I see somebody or when I have to meet somebody and I have to tell, oh, I will not get angry. Oh, Lord, give me your grace so I can speak so nicely as if you are speaking. You know. Grace gives us strength. You are weak. Remember, Paul was weak. What did he need? Grace. Grace can teach us. You go to uh, Titus 2, 11. That's we are going to come back again on this. Grace can teach us, yes. You want it to be taught? Ask Lord, give me grace, Lord. 14, grace can give us aid in suffering. When we are going through suffering, ask the Lord. I have seen many and heard many believers going through cancer and so many, but they are so much joyful. They never curse God, but they say it is the grace of God. Grace of God. Grace can give us stability. Grace can help render true service. You want to serve the Lord? You cannot serve in your own strength. You need grace. And grace can give the ability to preach. You want to preach? You want to give the good news of Lord Jesus Christ to others? You need grace. See? Grace, 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 grace. And this is just a few things I brought. What I wanted to say is that we need grace every day. So pray every day, Lord, give me grace. Moment by moment, you ask Lord to give grace. He can give you. Why? You know, because of the riches of his grace. 
is so much rich of his grace that it will never exhaust. So we thank the Lord. I'm not going to, as I said, to detail in every verse, but this is what the grace can do. As I said, I'm going to Titus 2, 11 to 13. You can open your Bible and see that. And three great blessings of grace we see. You know, in this, it's a great joy, you know, of if you read this Titus 2, 11 to 13, you will see three great blessings of grace. First of all, it brings salvation. You know, it brings salvation. Uh, let me open my Bible and read. So this way uh, I can. Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation. See, the, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation. So grace brings what? Salvation. Hath appeared to all men. Three blessings. Not only to us. But grace has appeared to all men, right? Titus 2 and 11. And what does the grace do? It teaches seven great lessons. And you will see in verse 12. What it teaches? Teaches us denying ungodly. That's the first thing grace teaches, right? Then it teaches denying worldly lust. Thirdly, it teaches us to live soberly. Grace, okay? And grace teaches us to live righteously. Titus 2.11, these are other verses if you want, you can go. Grace teaches us to live godly. See, all these things you need. Grace teaches us to live right in this life. And the grace helps us to look for the rapture in the second coming of Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 13, Looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God in our say, What are you looking for the blessed hope? I'm looking a lot for that blessed hope. When either I'm raptured or die, I will be with you. And the glorious appearing of the great God, whether he will appear when we die and see, or when we will see the rapture, God in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace, three great blessings, salvation, Appear all to men, it teaches seven great things. When I was thinking on grace, I had a lot of things, but I just put up. This is the outline of First Peter. Because Peter knew the grace of God. You remember, he denied Lord Jesus Christ. I will never deny you, Lord. I'm ready to go and die with you. Even in prison, what happened? He denied. And he understood the grace of God because... Lord, eyes were upon Peter. If you read uh, Luke, another uh, portion, Lord looked at Jesus, uh, Peter when he denied and he went out and wept bitterly. He understood the grace of God. Not only that, but when after the resurrection, the Lord personally met Peter to show him this grace. So the key, key theme of First Peter is God's grace and living in hope. So these are the one which I was dividing God's grace and salvation. See, whole five chapter is about grace because Peter understood grace. God's grace and salvation, God's grace and submission. So you need grace to submit and you read all these things, you will find out. And God's grace and suffering. Yes. Now when we go to the next verse, let me see the time. Okay, I have Second Corinthians 12, verse 9. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for you. Right? For my strength, that is power, in other translations say, is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, mark that word, therefore. Why therefore? Because of this. Most gladly, I will rather boast or rejoice in my infirmities. Why? That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Here we see twofold grace in this verse. First, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. God's help will be adequate. Adequate means more than enough. God will not disappoint us. Why? Because of his sufficient grace. The two grace we see here. 
and second for my strength or i become strong or you give me the power is made perfect in my weakness so my that is god's strength god's help is strong enough to give us victory in the midst of every trial to help us through every day see to help us to every day that is strengthening grace and to do every duty in spite of the thorn all said in spite of the thorn i thank you for the strengthening grace so here we see two fold grace so here it is a message of grace we are going to see more about that sufficient grace and strengthening grace so it is a message of sufficient grace let me ponder upon sufficient grace god is sufficient for our spiritual ministry if you see that in second corinthians chapter 3 i did not put it on the screen if you want our spiritual ministry god is sufficient for that second corinthians chapter 3 verse 4 to 6 god is sufficient for our material need second corinthians chapter 9 verse 8 though he was rich yet he became poor in his poverty we can become rich so all our material needs we can get in our physical need and that is in this physical need he gives the power no matter whether there is a thorn or no thorn he gives it is god's grace if god's grace is sufficient to save us right and that is true if god's grace is sufficient to save us surely it is sufficient to keep us and strengthen us in our times of suffering god's help is adequate and he will never disappoint our god is the god of all grace see it is in 1 peter chapter 5 in verse 10 god is the grace god of all grace in hebrews chapter 4 and 16 which is a very famous word his throne is a throne of grace acts chapter 20 in verse 32 the word of god that is the word of god is his grace and james 4 and 6 the promise is that he giveth more grace you need grace ask for him and he will give you god will give grace in everything we need there was a, sto a story uh, it was told by uh, charles hayden spurgeon and uh, i will just read uh, his story and it reminds us the adequate grace or the riches of his grace or that grace cannot exhaust it will go on and go on so this is what Uh, Charles Hayden Spurgeon uh, is a story told of uh, uh, Charles Spurgeon who was uh, one of the great preacher uh, it says he was riding home one evening after a heavy day's work he was feeling weary and he was depressed when the words came to his mind my grace is sufficient for you that words came into his mind when he was depressed in his mind he immediately compared himself to a little fish he said he compared himself to a little fish in thames river because he was in england apprehensive that fish he he, he identified himself as a fish in the uh, thames river and that fish was fearful worried and anxious like charles spurgeon was and he says lest drinking so many pints of water in river each day he might drink the thames he, he might drink the thames dry that fish was thinking because he was so depressed and fearful like a charles spurgeon thinking that if i drink this water every day 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 then the thames river will get dry then the father then father thames says to him drink of a little fish my stream is sufficient for you no matter how much you drink thames river is going to be full full and full see the grace of lord jesus christ this is what charles spurgeon was saying then 
he thought of a little mouse in the granaries of Egypt, that is during the time of uh, Joseph, okay? Uh, granaries of Egypt afraid, lest its daily neighbors, that means that the mouse is going and eating little by little grain every day. It says that if I eat this grain every day, one day it's going to, this supply is going to exhaust and it will cause me to starve to death. This is what that mouse was thinking. Then Joseph comes along. This is what Charles Spurgeon's story said. Then Joseph comes along and says, cheer up little mouse. My granary is sufficient for you. It's not going to get exhausted. Grace of God is sufficient. This is what he was thinking and the Lord was showing him. Then he thought of a man climbing some high mountain to reach its lofty summit like Himalayas mountain and dreading lest his breathing there might exhaust all the oxygen in the atmosphere. He says, if I go out there, all the oxygen in brain will go away. You know, I will have all the oxygen in myself. The creator booms with his loud voice out of heaven saying, breathe, oh man, and feel your lungs. My atmosphere is sufficient for you. All this thing is sufficient for me. Then we see that his message was not only of sufficient of grace, but it was more than that. So brothers and sisters, this grace is sufficient in every situation of our life. So his grace is not only sufficient grace, but it is a message of strengthening grace. Now God permits us to become weak, so we might receive strength. God's grace is strong enough to give us victory in the midst of every trial, to help us through every day, and to do every duty in spite of the thorn. I don't know, I put uh, the fifth verse I did not put, but let me, I will go through that again. Now, verse uh, 12, chapter 12, 9 to 12, as I said that I'm going to, uh, is this, let me go back in the first part to show you. Okay, now this I'm going to the fifth, the last part, God uses suffering to perfect his power. God is using suffering to perfect his power from nine. And this I will go again. So here I'm seeing it. So this is a continuous process. Okay, strengthening grace is a continuous process because verse 12 and nine, as we read this in NIV says, my power is being made perfect in, weak, in your weakness. It's a continuous process, strengthening grace. It's a continuous process. Now, two things I want to bring to how Paul learned, you know. So in Christian life, many of our blessings are through transformation. I think I should have written this, so at least you should have. The two words, just put it in your mind, transformation is substitution. Transformation it changes us. Substitution, we are asking Lord, substitute this for that. Transformation is, he transforms us, something else he, he gives us. Substitution is, Lord, don't give me this, but substitute me with something else. So, many of our blessings are through transformation. Transforms our weakness into power, so that is transformation and not by substitution that is changing the situation. So many of our blessings are through transformation and not substitution. When Paul paid three times, Lord, remove this thorn, remove this pain. He was, he was asking God for a substitution. You know, first he was asked, Lord, substitute me. I don't want this thorn. Lord, it's very painful. Substitute me with something else. Give me something lesser. So substitute, Lord. I don't want this pain. Give me something lesser that I don't have to go through all this pain. So three times he asked for substitution. Lord, take away this pain from me. He was saying, give me help instead of sickness. Substitute, Lord. Give me deliverance instead of pain and weakness. Substitution. Sometimes God does meet our substitution. Sometimes he does that. But other times he needs he meets our need 
by transformation. It does not substitute, but it transforms. So transformation is very much important in a believer's life. It does not remove the affliction. That is in transformation, it does not remove the affliction, but he gives us his grace so that the affliction work for us and not against us. That is the transformation. Affliction is working for Paul. Affliction will work for us and not against us. Paul prayed about his problem, but God gave him a deeper insight into what he was doing. When God said, my grace is sufficient, Paul got a deep inside understanding of the grace of God. Then he understood, Lord, I was asking for substitution. Oh, sorry, Lord, I don't want substitution. I want transformation. So Paul learned that his thorn in the, thorn in the flesh was a gift from God. He understood a gift from God. Would we? We would just murmur about it. But Paul thought it, Lord, this is a gift. As I remember, I said earlier in the earlier uh, Bible study, the Lord gives us good thing. If you, ask, um, if you ask for a man who is evil, if you ask for a fish, is he going to give serpent? No. And God gives good gift. So what is this good gift? The thorn. Paul understood right away. It is a gift from God. What a strange gift. There was only one thing for Paul to do. Accept the gift from God. Accept the gift from God and allow God to accomplish his purpose. God wanted Paul. Keep Paul from being exalted above measure. You remember that? He said, Lord, I don't want to boast. I'm giving you this thorn so you may not boast. So God wanted Paul to be, not to be proud, to be exalted above measure. And this was the way of accomplishing it. And what is that? My grace is sufficient for you. So, so when Paul accepted his affliction, he after three prayers, he accepted his affliction as the gift of God. And this made it possible for God's grace to work in his life. When, God, when Paul accepted the thorn as a gift, yes, what happened? God started working more grace in his life. Yes. So here we see God wanted to keep Paul from being exalted above measure and this was the only way of accomplishing. So Paul accepted affliction as the gift of God and this made it possible for God's grace to work in his life. It was then that God spoke to Paul and gave him the assurance of his salvation. So whenever we go through suffering, we should spend extra time in the word of God and we can be sure that he will speak with us. He always has a special message for his children when we are afflicted. God, see, God did not give Paul an explanation why I'm giving you the throne. God doesn't give an explanation what happens in our life and don't even ask for the explanation why, Lord, this is happening. So Paul did not, God did not give Paul an explanation. Instead, God gave him a promise. And what was that promise? My grace is sufficient for you. Yes, transformation. I'm not going to substitute Paul. I'm going to transform you in such a way that you will accept my grace, which is sufficient. And I will give you my power also. That was the transformation in Paul's life. We do not live by explanation. We live by promises. Our feelings can change, but God promises never change. Promises will generate faith and faith will strengthen our hope, which he has given to us. Paul claimed God's promise. What was his promise? My grace is sufficient for you. And on that, he drew, taking out, taking out as much grace he got that God offered him. And that turned his tragedy into triumph. This turned tragedy into triumph, transformation. Yes, important one thing. God does not give us his grace simply that we might endure. He doesn't give us grace that we may endure. 
our suffering. Even unconverted people can manifest great endurance. If you are not born again, many of them not born again, though they will endure, endure, endure. So God does not simply give grace that we may endure. God's grace enables us to rise above our circumstances and our feelings and cause our affliction to work for us. All the affliction which the Lord gives or suffering, it will work for us because of his sufficient grace. Lord wants to show his power. We will see that later on. God's purpose can be accomplished. That's why he brings some kind of problems in our life. God's want, God wants to build our character. So we may be more like our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Savior. God's grace enabled Paul not only to accept affliction, but to glory in them. Paul glorified in the affliction. Most gladly, I will boast in my infirmities. That's what he says. His suffering was not a tyrant that controlled him, but it was a servant. You know, this is beyond our understanding. I will come to that. And you will be amazed to see why the Lord gave the messenger of Satan, you know. So this suffering or the thorn was not a tyrant which controlled him. That's that thorn did not control him, but that thorn become a servant and it worked for him. That thorn worked for him beyond understanding. This is all deeper meaning, you know. When we go through pain and suffering and affliction, remember, it is for God's glory. It is going to work for us. Uh, because of the lack of time, I've got so many things to say, but I'm going to end here because we, I want to show what benefit did Paul receive because of his suffering and what made the difference, you know. So maybe God willing, I didn't see the time, but I will go back again and uh, remember all this thing which I thought is much, much deeper of grace. Accept what the Lord gives you. It is for our own good and we will see what it does to the Satan. We will see later on and uh, may the God speak with us today. Uh, it's a wonderful, I have a great burden for the grace and I will just end this uh, sharing and maybe the Lord speak with all of us. Very great grace, 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 more than that. You cannot understand that. Maybe you can take more.